Okay. Uh, so, so the original title of this session was V and V, the visual, view and visions. But Rajesh and I thought that discussing these would be above our pay grades and asked the organizer to turn it down to P and P, the perspective and the prospect, which is what I'm going to do. And in fact, uh, if you have been paying attention to the uh, archive, you have seen lots of views and vision on string theory for the, uh, on the archive over the past six months. And I have la laid this out on my kitchen table. And these are Snowmass white papers. And uh, Snowmass, in case you didn't know, is a process of American Physical Society Division of Particle Physics community planning exercise, and uh, they gather together about uh, once in 10 years uh, to discuss what's most interesting uh, to move forward. So Snowmass is actually the name of a village very close to Aspen, where Aspen Center for Physics is located. It's about 15 minutes drive, and this is where they first met, uh, 1982, I think. But after that, people start meeting at different locations. Right now, this week and next week, I think, uh, the SNOMAS uh, groups are meeting in Seattle, for example. But, so rather, so this, this, these have been laid out on the archive, so it's not, it's not very useful to just give you overview. So rather than going through all this SNOMAS paper, I'd like to make a few remarks from my idiosyncratic perspective. So I think this is one of the most important papers that everybody should learn. And uh, this is related to the lecture that Arthur Eddington gave uh, in Edinburgh in 1927, where he said that uh, the second law of thermodynamic is a supreme position, have a supreme position among the laws of nature. He said, if someone point out, point out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equation, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equation. If it is found to be contradicted by observations, well, these experimenters do bang things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse into deepest humiliation. So that's what uh, Eddington said. And since we are in Vienna, uh, I would also like to encourage you to go to the Central Cemetery and uh, pay tribute to Boltzmann and his equation like I did. This is actually, as you can see from my attire, this is not this year, uh, some years ago. But when you go there, I just wanted to tell you that it's very important to know where it is. So it's, I, I went there twice because first time I went there and I couldn't find his uh, tombstone. And then, so it's in group 14C, and his tombstone is number one. If you go to the front office, entrance office of the Great Central Cemetery, you can get a map. And you can also visit the various interesting things about musicians too. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. Uh, I think there, there is an equation here. So coming back to this equation. So the black hole entropy formula, which is this one, has inspired significant progress in string theory and quantum gravity over the decades. And its derivation by Strominger and Buffer gave us a very deep insight into microscopic state of black hole and led the development of powerful new techniques. I don't think anybody would disagree with this statement. And, but recently, uh, people have realized, in fact, uh, there are important correction to this formula. And as Witten said in his lecture, the, the left hand side is better defined, uh, the, the left hand side is better defined than the either term on the right hand side. And uh, so if you add these two terms, actually the formula becomes better defined and it was found to be really powerful. So for example, three years ago, uh, there was an amazing resolution of the puzzle about von Neumann entropy of Hawking radiation. And uh, this resolution demonstrated the power of the quantum extremal sub formula, which follows from, from this one. And where it was a semi-classical calculation, this was a great achievement, but I should also note that this is semi-classical uh, uh, calculation that is analogous to the Gibbons Hawking calculation of this formula. And we would like to do something like Strominger buffer. And so analogous to that, would be the, to realize a recent proposal by Chris Eicher and the collaborators that Daniel Harrow presented. Uh, but 
they, what his, uh, they, they present, uh, Daniel presented is a toy model of this situation. And so if you can do something like that in a theory related to Einstein gravity, well, that would amount to analog, uh, analogy of strong media buffer calculation for the ultimate resolution of the puzzle about von Neumann entropy of Hawking radiation. So in this context, wormhole also plays an important role. And uh, there are also other aspects of quantum gravity, such as quantum chaos, where wormhole plays an important role. So naturally, uh, the people's interest in wormhole have been, re been revived. But there are puzzles, like, for example, are these phenomena low-dimensional artifacts, or are they suggesting general features? And there is a question about ensemble averaging. We had a discussion session on that. So I just no wanted to note the recent paper by Schrenker and Witten sharpened the puzzle on their roles. And I think that, uh, that uh, some of these generic features of quantum gravity can be relevant to address uh, these questions about wormhole too. The absence of global symmetry, the distance conjecture, and the, more recently, the cobordism conjecture. And this seemingly generic property of quantum gravity theory uh, are actually closely related to each other, and they seem to be common features of all known quantum gravity theories, that, as far as we know. And in fact, uh, there is a precedent to that. Uh, this is actually a quote uh, from Einstein's uh, autobiographical note. Uh, he, this is a very interesting uh, part of the discussion. So he actually explained what the natural unit means. And he says that when, when uh, uh, you e express basic equation in natural unit, the only dimensional, dimensionless constant appear in the equations. But he says that concerning such, I would like to state a theorem, which at present cannot be based upon anything more than upon a faith in the simplicity, namely intelligibility of nature, that uh, there are no arbitrary constant of this kind. So that's what uh, he said in his autobiographical note. And there is a modern formulation of that that we ran in string theory, that is every parameter in quantum gravity is an expectation value of a dynamical field, and it can be varied by changing its expectation value. Well, this seems like a fundamental fact about uh, quantum gravity, and uh, it would be interesting to, it would be nice to understand this, whether this is actually really true or not, and at least we can try to prove this statement in the context of ADS CFT correspondence, for example. So how do we go about doing that? Well, let's try. So suppose there is a parameter in ADS, in the gravitational theory in ADS, there must be a corresponding parameter in dual CFT, because as you vary the gravitational theory, the corresponding CFT would vary. But if CFT parameter can be deformed by adding an exactly marginal operator to the CFT Lagrangian, then there must be a dy dy dynamical field in ADS. So this seems to be the derivation of this statement, except that this conditional clause is actually a conjecture in conformal field theory, as far as I know that this has never been derived rigorously. So the question is that can every conformal field theory parameter lambda be deformed by adding an exactly marginal operator phi to the conformal field theory Lagrangian? And if you think about this, this is actually analogous to the Neta theorem. So a Neta theorem has to do with the splitability of symmetry charge into product when you divide the uh, uh, Cauchy surface into segment. And this was actually, uh, 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 this played an essential role in my proof with Daniel Harrow about the absence of the global symmetry in quantum gravity. And uh, if you think about this, this statement is actually the splitability of uh, minus one form symmetry in conformal field theory. So, so if you, you need something like analogous to the Neta theorem for mi minus one form symmetry to prove, to prove the theorem which is analogous to the absence of global symmetry, which is the absence of arbitrary parameter, uh, that all the parameters are related to dynamical field. So there is this correspondence between no parameter in quantum gravity and no minus one form symmetry, uh, no one minus one form global symmetry in quantum gravity. And it seems like it's important to prove this statement. Related to that, I'd like to quote from Sonoma's paper on the analytic uh, conformal bootstrap that says that the new methods are needed to take advantage of the vast additional data encoded elsewhere in the conformal manifold, and to address questions about the manifold itself, such as 
whether there are universal property of conformal field theory at infinite distance. This is related to the infinite distance, the distance conjecture in the gravitational theory. So that lets me to also propose two uh, problems uh, in my talk. One is the one that I already mentioned. When a unitary conformal field theory has a continuous parameter, show that there is an exactly marginal operator generating its deformation. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is to find out whether there are universal property of conformal field theory at the infinite distance, as this white paper suggests. And, uh, uh, and so if so, quantify this property. And I'd like to actually highlight this importance of quantifying the property of a conformal field theory at the infinite distance in the conformal manifold. By the way, in principle, these two problems are independent, that even if this is false, you can still investigate this question. So I think that quantifying this infinite distance behavior in, the, uh, in this modular space is important. For example, one of the ways that it manifests is this uh, snow mass report, which is a sort of summary of all the snow mass white paper uh, in what they call theoretical frontier number one which is about quantum gravity, string theory, and black hole, summarized by Daniel Haro, Shamit Kachiru, and from Arda Sena. And this is a quote from the, their draft uh, report that says that one question of great experimental and theoretical interest is whether quantum gravity can produce inflationary models with relatively large value of R, the tensor to scalar ratio. It is possible that there is a theoretical upper bound for R, and it would be very interesting to understand where it is. So when I was reading this uh, uh, sentence, uh, paragraph, uh, I was reminded of my conversation that I had with uh, uh, the chair of my division at Caltech, the Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy. Uh, at that time, I was a deputy chair, so I was helping out, and I was sitting uh, in my office, in the division's office, doing some administrative work. That was in February of uh, 2014. And uh, the chair walked into, uh, by the way, this conversation did took place because he quoted it very often afterward to just to tease me. So he walked into my office and said that bicep two is going to announce that R is 0 0.2. And uh, that was like a month before it was officially announced. And I said, great, it will kill string theory. And uh, so, so the reason I said is uh, sort of summarized in this uh, diagram that appeared in uh, a paper by Kareshi and uh, uh, Valenzuela. Uh, so, that, so you can see that uh, there, is a, there is a line by distance conjecture below, which is allowed by distance conjecture. There is a rice bound above, which is allowed by a rice conjecture. The horizontal axis is R, the tensor scalar ratio, and the vertical axis is the amount that the inflaton traverses, and they intersect at about R equals 0 0.2. So that was sort of the reason that I, I made that statement. Of course, uh, the important thing, which I just, I didn't want this, this the showing this was not a point, but what I wanted to show was to demonstrate the importance of quantifying this. Because if you act, there is order one leeway in the, actually the distance conjecture, so this can easily go up and down. So that would make the location very different. And this is very important because Planck is now over here, and in the next 10 years, I think the bound can poss possibly go down to one notch below, like here. So then, for example, if this goes down a little bit, then we can be in tension. If it goes up, then uh, this conjecture will be totally relevant in this context. So this is very important to find out. And in fact, this point was raised in this Nomas paper on implication of quantum gravity for particle physics, in which they said uh, we'd emphasize that even in the large field inflation, where observable tensor model could be correlated with a Planck scale field space distance, related to the distance conjecture, only requires that the delta phi order one in Planck and could be entirely consistent with this bound. So, so depending on where precisely this line is located can be entirely consistent, and I think I agree with this view. And uh, so I think that it's very important to understand it, and it's, it's trying to do it actually bringing lots of in in interesting problems, such as a problem of physical mathematics. So this is a quote 
from the uh, paper, uh, draft paper called the Panorama of Physical Mathematics, which is the expanded version of the SNOMAS paper on physical mathematics, in which it say, they say that when the distance conjecture is made mathematically precise in the context of Calabrian compactification, some very non-trivial mathematics emerges. And uh, for example, this morning we had a very interesting talk by Lee uh, uh, on, on his uh, latest attempt to uh, uh, to discuss this. And uh, uh, so, have we have we already oh, really? okay? Uh, I'm halfway through. I apologize. Uh, and uh, uh, so, this involves very interesting mathematics because, for example, this. In order to address the issue of finite G Newton, we have to discuss compact Calabria manifold. And there is a big difference between compact Calabria and non-compact Calabria. There are many important questions of physics and the mathematics of compact Calabria that we need stronger tool to address them. In topological string theory, for example, for non-compact Calabria, there are many tools such as the topological vertex and matrix model, which you can calculate partial function to all order in genus expansion. In the compact Calabria case, the BCOB equation can only be integrated in the best case up to genus 15. But there are very important questions, such as the question about OSB conjecture, for example, that you need to know the asymptotic form of this partition function, for example. And there are other things I wanted to say. But what I wanted to say was even this kind of very idiosyncratic perspective of my short story, a uh, concept from variety of areas showed up, a black hole, wormhole, general symmetry, and uh, that even wider range of topics is discussed in SNOMAS white paper. And often if we want to work on some aspect of string theory, it becomes important to bring in many ideas. And for more than 30 years, the string conference series has been providing a unique opportunity for us to come together as a community to hear about the latest development on all aspects of string theory, to exchange ideas and to open new direction of research. So this is actually a very important thing for our community, I believe. So this leads me to the second part of my presentation, which is about the future of String Conference. And I first want to say that this is not an announcement I'm going to host the Strings Conference <laughs> next year at Caltech. I should say I have hosted String Conference three times, so I feel that I should give this wonderful opportunity to somebody else. And uh, so it be, I thought it would be interesting to go over how, uh, where the string conference took place. So, so these are the places where string conference took place over the last 30 years. But for the first 10 years or so, uh, it took, mostly, took place mostly in North America and some part of uh, Europe. And, uh, but it gradually expanded to other parts of the world, many more in Europe, some in Asia, for example, India, China, Japan, each hosted one string conference during this first decade of the uh, 21st century. And now uh, it has sp spread over even to Southern Hemisphere. And it's very interesting because if you count the location, then it's totally evenly distributed now in North America, Europe, and other areas, Asia, Israel, and the Southern Hemisphere. So this is sort of one way to measure the uh, act level of activity of string theory uh, all over the world. But there are other measures that uh, you can uh, measure the acti level of activity. One important measure is an invited scientific speaker of this conference. And it's kind, kind, of, kind of interesting to compare these two maps. And uh, so I put them on the top of each other. But I'd like to leave, so there are a few observations one could make, but I'd like to leave that to the exercise of the audience. <laughs> uh, so, so there are various issues more seriously that we should consider. Uh, I think that the budget is big. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And administrative support is, uh, is very uh, important. So that is a very important thing to consider. Uh, it was also already mentioned that carbon footprint uh, it's something we should consider seriously, that uh, uh, we can see the effect of climate change this week in Vienna, for example. And uh, 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 use of the uh, virtual space is something we learned for the last couple of years. Uh, we need to improve the diversity of this conference and, in fact, our community more. And also the conference should be welcoming to all members of our community. And we should have more support for student, postdoc, young researchers, and access from developing countries are important. 
And I should also point out the process to select and vet future conferences. Over the last 30 years, I mentioned, we have had the informal process of selecting host of strings conferences. The volunteer to host strings have come up spontaneously. A proposal was made to the International Advisory Committee for Strings Conference of that year, because that is the only formal body of a community, the community that we have, and an announcement was made at the Strings Conference. And many of us, including myself, thought that the String Conference, that the fact that the String Conference managed to happen every year for certain years in such an informal fashion is actually a good feature of our community. However, in recent years, this practice has been under some strain. And I, I think it seems to be time to update the process. So this was why I proposed to establish a planning committee for future string to the International Advisory Committee just a few weeks ago. And in fact, an ad hoc committee is being formed right now. And we have met a couple of times. And in order for the process uh, to be inclusive and transparent, I think we need a well-defined set of charges and processes uh, in which its members are elected, for example. But uh, there is a problem. There is a chicken and egg quality to do it, since we do not have a formal governing body to approve, and char uh, approve the charge and the process. So I think that one way to move forward is that if our community as a whole support this idea to move forward, uh, we, uh, we can move forward in that direction. And uh, so I'd like to encourage you actually uh, to post your comment, your thought on it, uh, on a Zurip chat. Fortunately, we have this Zurip chat for this conference, and I hope the organizer can leave this for a while so people can post and have some conversation on it. And uh, so we can discuss what will be the a more inclusive uh, uh, and uh, transparent way uh, to move forward, uh, to continue these wonderful conferences. I just wanted to also say a few words about the budget and other uh, issues. Uh, so this is actually the size of past string conferences, and uh, this is actually the total expense and the number of participants. Uh, you can see it's about, uh, the total cost is about a quarter million per each conference. Uh, in, in 2018, Okinawa, we had uh, twice as much budget because uh, we wanted to sort of invite uh, uh, younger uh, postdoc and students more, and we felt that bringing them to remote island requires more fellowships, et cetera, but typically about quarter million. But one thing to note is that last couple of years, we have had online virtual meeting, and the total expenses are like 100. But we, they invite, they had like five more people coming. So the one can ask the question, well, so, so what's the value that we get from this kind of in-person meeting? For example, uh, this is from my summary talk from the string conference last year in Sao Paulo. So one of the Facebook posts from a very distinguished string theorist, <laughs> who said that the organization of this year's string conference has been amazing. I have never before seen this level of open, honest, reflective discussion in a conference of more than 300 live participants. So there is some point to be made about this. So uh, there are a few things, uh, we can discuss this, but I list, try to list a few things I can think of in sort of pros of uh, virtual versus real. So as you, as you can see from my table, the virtual meeting had five times per well, Actually, if you look at the live participant, it's about twice, but was able to do it in one hundredth of cost. And it significantly, of course, reduced our carbon, foot, carbon footprint. And online discussion actually encouraged the participation of young researchers. So it's, for this kind of meeting, it's great. But sometimes the young people are hesitant to raise questions uh, in the live. And uh, so I have been hearing from people that uh, this is actually very nice for young people. And also accessibility from distance press is great. But there are, of course, things that we cannot this cannot yet duplicate in the current technological level. Chance encounter, small talks at uh, tea time, silly questions that I like to ask to expert. These can often lead to important new insight and open new direction of research. It's very hard to duplicate in this. 
And of course, uh, this also gives a networking opportunities. This is another thing I, can, I hear from young people, that uh, the at, uh, staying at home research activity deprives them of opportunity for networking. And I'm very grateful for the organizer this year to providing that to our community. And also, I like to say we, I enjoyed the very going out to dinner, concert, uh, wonderful uh, uh, party, uh, conference banquet, etc. This is a great opportunity to enhance our camaraderie and cohesiveness of the community, which is very hard to do in virtual. So I think there are uh, 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 benefit on both of these possibility and moving forward, we might consider sort of combining these two. And given this, I would like to announce that Spring 2023 is going to be hosted by Perimeter Institute, but for now virtually, because they don't have enough, big enough auditorium for 400 people, although it, they are considering the possibility of bringing in some number of people, and this is work in progress, and uh, we are currently discussing dates uh, that, is, uh, uh, that works for them, as well as other schedule. I'd like to point out that we also have satellite meetings, so string Fino will take place in the first week of July in Dejon, which is a new institute for basic sciences. I think one of the uh, members spoke this morning in Korea. And then followed by string mass uh, from, uh, uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So we have a lot of things to look forward to uh, next year. But I'd like to end with, I think, I have one, and in fact, the most important thing that I, I need to do as the last speaker of this conference, which is to thank the organizer of this wonderful meeting. I admire their courage that after the South Africa conference went online, after San Paulo con conference went online, we are still gradually, only gradually getting out of the pandemic, and having this conference requires the courage, attention, effort, and commitment of everybody wearing red t-shirts and not. Uh, and I really admire their courage and determination and dedication to the community. So I think uh, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them. First, the International Scientific Committee, chaired by Johanna, and this is something actually I'm proud of, but I started this uh, the string conference in Okinawa. And the reason I did that was that I was attending the string 17 in Israel, and it was great scientific program. And as I was attending it, uh, I became increasingly worried that local organizer in Japan would not be able to do that. Until now, local organizer was uh, doing this. And this is actually one way to make our uh, a conference more inclusive and diverse and representative of all areas, and this is great. And I also thank the selection committee of Gong Show, which I enjoyed enormously with very enthusiastic chair by Irene Valenzuela yesterday. And uh, tonight uh, we'll have the public lecture by Neta Engelhardt, and I'd like to thank uh, Anton uh, Rebhan of uh, uh, Te Technical University of Vienna and his group for hosting this. We we'll also have the uh, 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 colloquium by uh, uh, Andy uh, tomorrow at seven at the same location. I'd like to thank the local organizing committee, uh, many are wearing red shirt, t-shirts, uh, for having this conference go so smoothly, and uh, uh, thank you so much. I would like to note there are two people from different locations. I think they were student or postdoc here and moved on. Uh, uh, Abiram, for example, he, you are getting lots of email from him, I'm sure. Uh, he's now my colleague at IPMU. I would like to brag, in fact, today, uh, three of the speakers are aff affiliated to IPMU. And so I'd like to uh, thank uh, all these people. And, and then, of course, uh, finally, uh, I'd like to thank the main organizer from these two institu main uh, t institutions that hosted the conference, Stefan and Danielle. Thank you so much. So with this, I would like to invite organizing members, Danielle, Stefan, and everybody wearing red t-shirts, come up to the podium and recognize their achievement. <laughs> 